My name is Miroslav Wolf, and I teach here at Yale University. I teach in the Divinity School as well as this course that um, is offered for the university as a whole entitled Faith and Globalization, which I teach together with Tony Blair and uh, Professor Douglas Ray from the School of Management. My guest today is Muna Abu Suleiman. Uh, Muna Abu Suleiman is the executive director of the Prince Al Walid bin Talal Foundation and the leading media personality in the Middle East. She has served as co host of one of Middle East Broadcasting Company's most popular social programs, which reaches worldwide audience by satellite. Ms. Abu Suleiman was named Young Global Leader by World Economic Forum in 2004, and she also serves as lecturer in American literature at King ha Saud University in Riyadh. Muna, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you here. You are a professional woman, as just I just read from your bio, and you're also a celebrity. And you're a Muslim woman who wears a headscarf. Some people, modern Westerners, and I suppose also uh, traditional um, Muslims, might think that there is something contradictory, incongruous about this. Um, well, yeah, some people might think it's uh, very strange that somebody who wears a headscarf actually has a normal life. And um, unfortunately, the media plays a little bit of a role sh in showcasing how um, some women who look like me are actually um, under extreme poverty. Uh, the Islamic world in general is huge, and it has a lot of poor countries in it. A lot of the mm -hmm. developing uh, uh, countries are Muslim, and therefore the image that you get is of somebody who's oppressed, who's not having access to information. But I assure you, there are a lot of people who look exactly like me, speak like me, and um, are very professional. So it might be contradictory, but it's very normal. But but head headscarf, uh, correct me if I'm uh, if I'm mistaken. Traditionally, has b uh, has been or the veil has traditionally symbolized um, and indicated kind of a d domestic sphere of of of, of women. Is the, would that be correct? That's kind of in the patriarchal system. That's yes, which we are not um, a part of, hopefully anymore. No, um, the headscarf symbolizes modesty. Mm -hmm. It symbolizes faith. It symbolizes. Um, somebody's commitment to living a certain lifestyle that is um, um, making the family uh, the most important part of your uh, priorities. Um, it does not mean that you stay at home. Um, it has meant a lot of people um, lack of access, like in Turkey, if you wore the headscarf, you were mm -hmm. not able to go to universities for some time. Um, in, in France, you can't go to schooling even if you wear the mm -hmm. headscarf. So there has been oppression associated with it, but it's actually coming from the secularist or the Western point of view rather than from uh, the Eastern. Mm. So, so you, you're pointing to um, uh, perspectives on and debates about headscarf in France. On the one hand, Nicolas Sarkozy has uh, made comments mm -hmm. about that in Turkey uh, mm -hmm. since I believe it's 1983 mm -hmm. uh, or, or so. It has been a, at the center of the uh, of the discussion of the political life. Why why does it matter so much? It's a piece People of are piece of clothing. With women all over the world. You know, in our parts of the world, it's the scarf. Over here is sexualization. You know, the ads yeah. and using women's bodies as a uh, you know, um, uh, to add uh, sales. So women's bodies, for some reason, are like a hot issue, uh, either for covering up or not covering up. Um, I mean, recently the uh, the Miss Universe pageant, I think, or Miss World pageant, has now, or Miss California, I'm sorry, Miss California pageant, mm -hmm. has said there's no more swimsuit um, uh, part of the uh, competition. Mm -hmm. they, because they said this is actually demeaning to women, mm -hmm. that judging yourself on that basis, as using that as a, uh, a huge part, a component for the scoring of who gets to be Miss uh, California. So uh, women are just like a hot rod for uh, controversy. Mm. Um, it just takes different shapes in different places. But uh, so, so you, you don't think for you this is not a, a, some kind of a, a political statement. It, it's politicized. For you, it's an expression of your faith. Exactly. And so how is it related to, to faith? Well, if you wear the headscarf, you are saying that I believe um, what God has said, the way that um, the world should work, the family should work, is uh, right. That um, in a way we believe that 
the most important part of preservation is preserving the family and making sure that it stays intact as a unit. And that we acknowledge that men are visual and um, are attracted to women uh, through sexuality, the overt sexualization. So what you're doing is you're limiting uh, the overt sexualization of a woman to the private sphere where it actually advances something, advances family making and um, mm -hmm. and trying to help men actually stay within that to um, limit temptation. Um, that's a certain world point of view, which by wearing the headscarf, I say I subscribe to it. And so you don't feel that that's oppressive to you as a, 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 as a woman? No more something. than having to work out, you know, yoga and um, dieting so that I can fit into a bikini in the summer and look good, and if I don't look good, then <laughs> and it's the same kind of <laughs> oppression, just different forms, really. So in a sense, what, what you're saying, uh, you know, culture has a, uh, and our belief systems have a, a certain forms of uh, expectations. They're embedded in the I in the culture, and if one sees that as oppression, one might as well think, see whole life as oppression, right? Exactly, and it's uh, just the way that you believe. What, what yeah. you believe is important. We believe family is important. We uh, believe that uh, women, um, when she loses. Uh, uh, the male in her life, um, especially if she has created a family with him, is as a weakness because then she has to become a single mother. And mm -hmm. usually um, even the monetary value goes out with the male, gets spent on his new family. So therefore it limits her financial access. So there's a lot of issues that actually impact a woman and her family much more than the male. The, ma the man can just leave. Um, so it's a way to actually protect women's rights and women's um, needs at a very important part. It's saying that keeping the family intact is very important and that through nature men get attracted to women and how do you actually try to um, make it in a way that helps both of them stay in that marriage. Uh, some, uh, some, some Western women might say well in a way women, men are attracted to women is men's problem it shouldn't be theirs. Yes. Uh, there shouldn't be imposition on women uh, because of uh, particular bent in the behavior of men. Let them deal with it. Well, yeah, and that's why we have a lot of divorces and we have a lot of you know, children see. here in the U.S. <laughs> and in the Western world who are growing up in single parenting. So, yeah, if you decide to subscribe to that point of view, you're saying I'm willing to live with the consequences um, or that I don't see them as grave enough. And that's not the world point of view that we subscribe to. That's interesting. Uh, but you subscribe to the equality of men and women, oh, yeah, right? Definitely, no, yes. No, no, yeah. So, so it's, it's just a difference and yeah. recogni the recognition of that, of that difference in a particular form of cultural relations between the two. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, um, we believe that women have two roles. I mean, part of it is motherhood. Motherhood is a role. It is actually a duty, and it's not something that you um, um, you subscribe. You know, you you uh, uh, give to somebody else. Although now I've heard that there's all these wombs in India being rented out to even like because you don't want to ruin your body, so you can actually have somebody else have the baby for you. Um, so there's a business now that creates this. This yeah. is not something we would want in our culture. Um, so there's equality uh, in the way that women have full access to education, full access to work. It's just that when she needs to be paying attention to her family, mm. society and men should support her, not leave her. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, s I suppose many many uh, women, as well as men in Western culture, would think that uh, kind of rent a womb. Uh, kind of a, uh, a, a approach would be uh, inherently degrading to uh, uh, certainly those women whose wombs are being uh, uh, being, being rent, uh, rented. But yeah, the, the well, you know, yeah. sometimes it is through a real reason where somebody cannot have a child. Yeah. But I've I've seen some people say that they don't want to be inconvenienced for nine months. Mm. Um, and so I mean, it, it gets. Uh, you know, something leads to something leads to something, and abuses occur. So for us, family is basically the mother and the father creating a family if they can, or if they're not, they can't. Then right. that's it. Right. Um, you know, we've talked now ab about the, the uh, headscarf uh, issue as a as a kind of Western almost. Uh, uh, Muslim community kind of issue, Western value, I suppose I should say, uh, or contemporary Western values, because um, when I was growing up, it was West. Uh, I take it my nanny always wore uh, um, a some headscarf, kind of headscarf, some kind of uh, headscarf, and mm. all women, uh, all women uh, did. But as was it religious or was it cultural? 
It was partly cultural, but it was also it, it was also religious. Yeah. Uh, I know in, on Sundays women were supposed to cover their heads. That's why they wore hats. But I never, I mean, I never researched it to know what was the religious reason behind that. C certainly, certainly, when I was growing up in uh, in Eastern Europe, um, all the babushkas uh, that that wore those uh, headscarves, <laughs> they wore those head headscarf because it was partly cultural, but mm -hmm. also it was it was it comes from the from the religious tradition where m women ought to cover their uh, their heads it says says that in uh, in one of the texts uh, of the apostle paul really yes yes that's covering I, I, you know that's news to me um, oh, they're, they're, they're i'll be using that line a lot more now <laughs> i'll show you where where it is in the in the text it's first corinthians 11 and there were big debates about whether whether that's a culturally conditioned injunction mm. uh, connected with a particular uh, situation of women at that time, or, the, or whether it, that's transculturally uh, binding. Yeah. Um, um, let me just explain something. The problem is that with the headscarf, even within our societies, but it's become um, a symbol of being conservative mm -hmm. um, or being good or evil. So if you wear the headscarf, you're supposed to be a good Muslim, and if you don't wear it, then you're not. And I don't believe in that. I, don't, I believe that you know some people are able to, um, you know, do certain things, and other people choose not to. That doesn't mean they're bad or good. Which, unfortunately, that has become part of the judgment process, both in the East and the West. Right. So yeah. in the West, if I go and wear the headscarf um, in you know public speaking events, people immediately say she's conservative. She's probably you know um, uh, doesn't believe in democracy. They have all these assumptions mm -hmm. um, immediately just because of the way that I look, um, and I think that needs to change. But it's interesting you're mentioning something that I wanted also to, to bring up and that is that the debate about headscarf is not simply West uh, Muslim uh, world or Muslim uh, um, kind of religious and cultural uh, perspectives but it's also within the Muslim mm -hmm. world itself is, is, a, is a hotly contested I issue in a sense. Uh, well, I'm, uh, let me let me. Let, what I'm referring to is is Tantawi, uh, Sheikh Tantawi's. That's uh, not hijab. That's niqab. That's niqab. That, There's that, a difference. There's a huge okay. difference. Yeah, but but uh, I, I mean, in j I, I I know that's a, that there's a huge uh, a huge difference. Uh, but but it's, it, it concerns the, the question of covering. So the mm. debate, women's covering, right, and women's women's role, are contested uh, also within Islam itself. Okay. So. Um, let's, I think this is a very important point to make, especially to the audience who may not be familiar with this, is that there's hijab, which you cover the hair and you wear modest clothing, mm -hmm. and there's the niqab, which you cover the face, mm -hmm. and basically wear extremely loose clothing, uh, so that, um, and personally, I don't believe niqab is part of our religion, period. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of texts, a lot of verses, a lot of um, hadith that actually show that it's not. Um, some people have um, and I think it, that's part of where the you know, uh, patriarchal society did oppress women, have uh, made it to seem obligatory. Uh, but that's a very small minority, by the way. People who are in a cop mm. are a very small minority within Islam. Um, I believe in niqab as a personal choice. Um, I don't believe it as a religious mandatory um, uh, you know, edict. Um, so therefore, for me, uh, Tantawi saying that nobody can wear the niqab, which he did not say, is wrong. What he said is that in the school that were, there were all girls, Mm. You shouldn't wear the niqab because there's no reason. But didn't girls. he ask this girl to take off before before he made the pronouncement? Yes, because he asked because she was in an all girls school. Uh, the way he dealt with it, I think, was extremely idiotic. <laughs> I'm uh <-huh>. sorry. <laughs> it's just I, I, there's no explanation for the way he dealt with it. Um, he's not very well known for his tact. Mm -hmm. But the point that he was trying to make and that got lost was that women among themselves should not cover their faces. Um, mm -hmm. Because that's even for the you know the minority interpretation of niqab, that's not allowed. Um, uh, female uh, face is for me is part of her identity, mm -hmm. and if you cover it up, then you know you, you lose your identity, and that's why I don't like it. Uh, but I'm not going to say to somebody don't wear it. So you wouldn't regulate it at the state uh, at a state no, I level. It, no. You you would argue for it on. Um, Personal. On cultural, personal, moral, yeah. or religious even grounds. If right? I was at the state level and if, if I was making uh, decisions, I would say it's a personal choice, but I'd also make sure that everybody understands that it's not an Islamic edict. Because sometimes people do get confused, and that was the part of a part of Tantavi's claim, right? That it is mm. not an Islamic; it's a yes, cultural it's rather than Islamic yes, exactly. um, uh, perspective, right? Um, now, obviously, wearing hijab hasn't prevented you 
from uh, uh, from uh, doing extraordinary uh, well, things. I wouldn't call them extraordinary, but well, uh, uh, well, you you were named a young global leader by the World Economic uh, Forum. So how does along one with the one thousand and two hundred other people, by the way, over five years? So world um, is world uh, is a world is a large place. A large place. Uh, so how does one get to be uh, um, you and others a uh, young global leader? Um, well, there are different criteria. Basically, you're supposed to excel in something mm -hmm. and affect other people's lives. So we have a lot of young global leaders who are in great, doing great work in philanthropies um, or in the finance system or in medicine or discovering things or creating scholarship that is pushing the edge. Uh, for example, Daniel Shapiro, who's doing a lot of work on negotiations. So. Um, it's different criteria, but you're supposed to excel at something. Mm -hmm. And I think my work in the media had pushed me in that direction, especially in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. And it was a recognition from uh, the World Economic Forum that my work matters. And that was a, you know, a great honor to have uh, been chosen. Some people think that um, global uh, institutions uh, like World Economic Forum, and in general, uh, uh, top echelons of power that participate in globalization processes are very masculine, that they're very they uh, inhospitable, <laughs> inhospitable to <laughs> women. <laughs> I like that. They think it is. Uh, no, it is. <laughs> it is. Uh, it so is. tell it's me about how, how do you, so how do you, uh, how do you experience it as a, as a, as a maybe non-feminine, not just the, the no. masculine, right? So, uh, no, I mean, if you look anywhere in the world almost, um, power makers are mostly men. Mm. Uh, you have a few exceptions here and there, but they're getting more. Uh, women, as they um, actually uh, go beyond feminism, go beyond just the education and higher education, mm. are actually pushing the limits of um, uh, reaching the top. Uh, they haven't done it in masses, except when there's a quota system. Mm. Um, but I think that within the next 50 years, we're going to see a huge influx of women reaching um, the top uh, decision-making uh, um, uh, positions and in large numbers. And I'm not sure if that's going to change the way we run the world, though. Mm -hmm. people assume, so say more about that. Yeah, people assume mm -hmm. that women will always spend more on health and education because that's what they care about. And I'd love to believe that, that our nurturing um, nature will always lead us into this. Um, yet, at the same time, um, I think it's more about addressing our needs. I think it'll become, instead of men addressing their needs, there'll be women addressing what they think are their needs. And do you think, do you think also it has to do something with the styles of leadership? Some people oh, yes, would, of course, would suggest, different. you know, men are hierarchical, top down. Uh, more competitive. Uh, more competitive, um, yes. women are more networking, uh, mm -hmm. and the style We like to multitask, doing, network, right. we yeah, yeah. work in teams. It's all been proven in studies that most women, again, there are always exceptions, but most women do work better in uh, collaborative environments. But again, will the collaboration end up being something that we think is different from masculine result right. or not? I think that's going to have to uh, wait a few a uh, a years. A and, and might not the institutions and the, and the modern ways of communicating and the ty kinds of, um, kinds of um, uh, projects that are being undertaken in modern institutions, might it not be that they themselves, in a sense, require more collaborative ways mm. of resolving problems so that all top-down uh, way doesn't work for men either? Uh, these no, I know, but men don't do multitasking very well. I mean, I love going to airports and seeing men with children check through the airport and women. And the woman is pushing the cart, talking on the phone, getting the kids all around, and it's not a lot of hassle. Whereas a man doing the same thing, getting like the baggage in, making sure all the tickets are in, and all the kids are in the same place, it just seems there's always a lot, excuse me, a lot more commotion. Well. <laughs> uh, so there's, <laughs> I, you know, I, I do it in airports all over the world. It's like my kind of measuring of seeing how um, people deal with uh, different uh, tasks at the same time. And, um, you know, I, I'm not going to say that male way of doing things is always wrong or that female way of doing things is always right. What I want to do is that it becomes something that is more mainstream that fits both. Because if you do it only the, the female way, you're losing half of the pop population. And some studies have shown in education that one of the reasons men are not doing so well in school anymore is that they don't work so well in teams. 
They need mm. a little bit of competition. They need a little bit of change. Th so there's all these schools now that are separating kids in sixth to eighth grade for science and math so that they can um, deal more with um, learning different learning styles right. and seeing if they would actually um, do better or not. So I think it's a learning curve that we're going through as the world trying to figure out what is one way of ruling, not feminine or masculine. You are a mother of two daughters mm -hmm. and uh, a professional woman. And often in the lives of professional women and men who take care of the children, there's a tension between home mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and profession. And sometimes that's in the way of yeah. uh, achieving uh, and um, certain goals and breaking the glass uh, ceiling. ceiling. What was your experience? Um, first of all, there is a huge difference between doing things in the East and doing things in the West, mm -hmm. both culturally, expectations, etc. But also in the East, where I come from, the family supports you. There's a huge network. So if you do want to actually um, achieve things, I don't have to worry about, you know, um, timing of babysitters, for example, because mm -hmm. my mom you know, if I end up built in babysitter, a built in <laughs> babysitter, exactly. She, she'll take care yeah. of the child for a couple of more days if I have to travel. And, you know, um, and I don't pay anything for it. So, you know, I don't have to also be at a financial disadvantage to be able to create a setup hmm. that yeah. allows me to achieve. So that the family in the East, if you do want to achieve, you'll find it, you're much more productive. Mm. Um, at the same time, as you said, there is limits. Um, I have to make choices. How much of a mother do I want to be? Do I think that being a mother is just giving birth or being there for the children when they need me and building a very strong relationship so that I can build their character and actually be the most important um, anchor for them? Mm. And I believe that, yes, you do make sacrifices and it might delay your uh, you know, trajectory. Um, it also might, but also the skills that you learn from dealing with children. and. The changes. Multitasking there. Multitasking, <laughs> yeah, majorly. Um, but also, you know, um, patience and learning how to actually juggle things it helps you later on in your professional life, um, yeah. especially the patience part, I think. Men don't have a lot of patience. Some men, I would hope. Some, <laughs> some. Most men. I've seen, you know, usually men are, you know, if they work through all the night to do a project, I'm like, I'm sorry, I need my eight hours of sleep, and they're my children, and I might do it for a very limited time, but I'm not willing to do it for, you know, six years to get into a mm, partnership. Mm, mm. Um, my children also need me. Um, we've been talking so far mostly about um, professional uh, women. Uh, majority of women in this world um, aren't professional mm -hmm. women. They're at homes, and especially if they're poor, they, I won't say seem now, I would make a claim, they bear the great brunt of the tough life that it mm. is to lead as a poor person and mm. often having a kind of a stray husband who doesn't care so much about uh, the family and the burden yeah. of living in patriarchal, uh, oppressive uh, setting of lack of care, mm -hmm. uh, as well as taking care of the children. Uh, it's, mm. it's a heavy toll, uh, yeah. toll on, on, on women. Exactly, and this is the whole point about Islam, is that realizing taking care of the children, whether you're poor or rich, it is a huge amount of energy investment and time and that therefore society and men have to support you and that if you don't create certain things or certain expectations um, then what happens is that men do stray and they society doesn't support you because it's easier to ignore you mm. um, and you bear the brunt of it so the whole point of trying to balance that in Islam part of it is hijab Part of it is seeing motherhood as a huge contribution to society. Um, and, you know, um, the world doesn't see motherhood as a contribution to society. They say they do, but it doesn't put any kind of numbers on it. So, for example, if you're a mother who took care of your kids and were reasonably educated, you could not get back into the workforce once you leave your, um, your kids grow up. Because so would you want to change that? Oh, Somehow. there are a lot of things that I would like yeah. to change. Uh, one of them is that how do we actually acknowledge financially motherhood so that if you do come after 20 years of raising your kids looking at your multi skills uh, multitasking skills looking at the patients looking at the management looking at all these things that you've actually done and have to do 
um, help you maybe hand the professionalism of it, but then say, you're not starting as an intern, you're not starting as a novice, you're starting at um, assistant uh, manager, and therefore your salary will be this much more, mm -hmm. um, rather than having her start from zero at the age of 40, um, and saying, you know what, all what you did to society for the past 20 years raising great kids, that's zero for us. And doesn't count in a sense as work experience, right? Does not count as work experience, does not count in any way whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting because uh, the, the discussions that I've heard in the West were how, do, how does one figure out maybe to remunerate women who stay, who stay home so that they don't get simply uh, mm -hmm. financially um, uh, behind. But you're suggesting, well, uh, quite apart from remuneration, it's a question of reentry re into the well, workforce. And yeah. there you need uh, also to have your experience count. Yeah. The only remuneration that happens is that when you get a divorce, if you, st if you are a stay-at-home mom, um, the courts actually acknowledge your role in helping your husband reach his because hmm. of taking care of things. So therefore, you get fifty percent of assets after uh, you know while you were married or something like that. So that's the only time. But this idea has not carried over. I see that yeah. the work that you do actually counts for something other than in that instant. So you see uh, also. Um, not, not just need for, for kind of structural changes uh, and, and cultural uh, changes, expectations and valorization of women's work as important. You mentioned Islam uh, and as religion, uh, it is important, especially for the impoverished mm. uh, women. Can you say yeah. more, about, well, more about that? For example, um, when we talk about the balance of family, the man is the one who has to provide. Even if his wife has a lot of money, mm. it's his duty to provide for the family. Why? So that she doesn't feel she has to go out to work. Mm -hmm. And it's seen as an equal contribution. And, and unfortunately, some men do abuse that. But it is seen as an equal contribution for what she's doing. So therefore, she retains her financial. She's not spending her own money. She retains mm -hmm. her financial uh, independence. And it is seen as his obligation. So therefore, she can stay at home if she wants to and take care of the kids without feeling that she's um, under stress. Mm -hmm. So that's one instant of of the balance. Um, she gets credits in, in Islam for mothering and he gets credit for providing. It is not seen as one is better than the other, but complementing for the family. Um, if that's the question, if I understood it correctly. Right. You know, I, I, I'm thinking also of the discussions and some of the sociological studies uh, of influence of Pentecostalism, especially in uh, Latin America, mm. on uh, on the kind of working poor and especially uh, on women. The talk about paradox of gender, mm. where that type of Pentecostalism would affirm the hierarchical relationships, mm. but at the same time give voice to v women. Uh, Reign in the man, uh, domesticate in a sense the man, <laughs> yes. make it, make him responsible, as you were yes. saying in Islam, yes. for providing. And for, therefore, for society, the if he doesn't provide, society will ostracize him. There will be there's a, a huge cost to to not fulfilling what he needs to fulfill. Right. In this case, it would be this religious community which would say, well, th this is no way to be a uh, to be yeah. a man. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to. Uh, and there would be penalties for him. I mean, sure, he, he wouldn't sure. be able to do other things because people don't trust him. It's seen as part of his character to be able to do that. Um, yeah, um, it, it is unfortunate that you know women, because of physical disability, pregnancy, and <laughs> having children, are for a significant part of their life at a weaker position than men. We see it all the time, um, mm. everywhere, whether it's the Western or the Eastern world. Um, the poorest people in any society are usually single mothers. It's not about race. It's not about um, education. It's that mm. single mothers usually end up being uh, the poorest, and they suffer the, the, the most. Um, and do, 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 what, what kinds of things do you think uh, can be done in order to uh, uh, address that? At, at the global, it's a global phenomenon, it's a, a global thing. problem. Mm. What, what do you think uh, can be done about that? Well, I think acknowledgement of the different roles that people mm. play, that um, acknowledgement of the economical significance of motherhood, not only in, in actually sure. your skill set for work, but also when you create a family that is more balanced, more happy, mm. um, more um, adjusted. What does that mean for society later on? And, you know, a less cost of um, uh, medical interventions because children eat better when you're, you know, uh, it's home cooked food rather than um, outside food. Um, what is the benefit of people not having psychological problems later on, you know, and snapping? Or, so what is that real benefit of mm -hmm. having stable families um, on one point, but also the, the real 
um, economic value of motherhood, I think, needs to be evaluated. So when you say I'm a mother, it doesn't f you don't feel like you're a lesser person than somebody else who's professional, which is what happens. And the, your, your comment takes us, take us back to, in a sense, where we started when we talked about, when you talked about a headscarf, mm. uh, importance of family, importance of uh, mother, motherhood, yeah. and we've come uh, full circle uh, uh, back. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for, this, uh, for this interview.